Hi friends, welcome. My name is Baron, and this is my channel where I talk about book stuff because I'm the book Baron. <laughs> Now, in purple. Uh, yes, I finally dyed my hair purple. I'm done with the chaos, hopefully. There was a lot that went on. I had a big work conference. Uh, there was a wedding. My husband and I got a lot of bad news in our personal lives. So it's just been a little bit of a rough month. I'm still recovering from that conference. If my energy is a little bit off, that's it. Um, it's also raining. So I have terrible lighting right now, but I, I pushed this off to the last possible second. Um, so I have to film when it doesn't look that great. Without further preamble, let's get into things. September. So let's wrap this baby up. I I think I counted 13 books. So I got to a fair number of books. A lot of them were on the shorter side. That said, I didn't get to the books that I was most excited for from my TBR. So I didn't get to the Charity B book, Anointed. I didn't get to the Liza James book, Frost. And I did not get to, I never pronounce it correctly. So I'm just going to insert the cover here by Freitas Moon. <laughs> So I'm probably going to push those off to October. Other than that, they're in no particular order because chaos is my favorite. Let's just jump into things uh, with a historical. Yes, you heard that correctly. I read An Island Princess Starts a Scandal by Adriana Herrera. This is the second book in the series. It's not on KU. It's a historical sapphic romance. A lot of this is that Manuela knows she's into women, but has sort of resigned herself to the fact that she's going to need to marry a man in order to provide for her family. She ends up getting an invitation to go show her paintings in Paris. And she's like, okay, I know I'm engaged to this guy and I will be a good wife after I have this fun summer in Paris. She ends up running into Cora while she's there, who's this ruthless businesswoman, but she doesn't know that initially. So Manuela ends up going to this meeting about selling a piece of her land that Cora needs to complete a railway project and really like put her stamp on the business world. She says, okay, I know how important this piece of land is to you. So I'll sell it to you. But in addition to money, I need you to show me a good sapphic time while I'm here in Paris. We're mixing business and pleasure. So what could possibly go wrong? I loved the diversity. We're talking about Hispanic culture. It was also very feminist, but still felt firmly in a historical context where it didn't feel like someone was trying to jam more feminist beliefs now into a historical setting. They were still sort of operating in a very historical context. I liked that. I guess my two big criticisms, one, they were talking a ton about paintings and it was really hard because I really just wanted to be able to see these paintings that they were talking about. I can kind of imagine what they would look like, but I really just wanted to see them and, and think through the imagery for myself as well. I have a hard time when you tell me what art looks like and <laughs> so I was, I was a little resistant to that. I also just got a little bit bored because a lot of this is them going to different places, sitting and talking. And you did get a lot of different interactions with different people. People. It gave her a good way to like process everything that was happening to her, but it was really frustrating because I was just like, I just want to do something. I gave it three stars, but it's a really solid historical romance. I still recommend it to people. I think it, again, this is like a, I'm the problem, not the book's the problem. <laughs> Next up, sweet Lord. Um, Bad Things Feel Best by Ivy Smoke. I have a spend a weekend with me vlog coming um, where I read this book. This is a new to me author. It is on KU and it's available both in a visual and audio format. The reason I picked it up, I thought it sounded a little bit like Verity, which is one of my favorite Colleen Hoover's. Do not judge me, I will come for you. This is supposed to be sort of a thriller romantic suspense. It was a little bit more rom-com-y to me and there was a love triangle. The basic premise of this is that Hazel, she just got a job working for an author as her assistant. So she goes to this woman's private island and everything there is just kind of like creepy and spooky including the man that she finds out that she's actually working for, Mr. Remington. But he's kind of creepy. He's putting off a weird vibe. He's not giving her a lot of information about himself, especially personal details, including his first name. The whole island sort of has this like spooky, creepy vibe. So <laughs> this book, <laughs> I hated this book so much. 
much. It started out okay. I was like, it's a little rom com -y, but I was like, oh, it's kind of balancing the thriller aspects. But really, this devolved into this book just really having an identity crisis. It felt rom com -y when we're in Hazel's head. We're kind of told that things are creepy and maybe there's a thriller element. Hazel plays detective and like maybe there's some paranormal elements. She full on Bella Swan at one point. Like she was just <sighs> three things I know are true. He's allergic to garlic. He's been alive for a long, long time. He uses old timey language. Yeah, like she did that whole bit. I was like, eh. And then at one point I thought it was satire. Cause I was like, this is so strange that this can't be real. I am wrong. The other thing I just, the characters were not very fleshed out. So like a lot of the romantic elements didn't really work. It just felt like a couple of hot people existing near each other. And then like right towards the end, they're like, what if we bone? It just like didn't really make the love triangle work. There's a vlog coming where I <laughs> have more thoughts and share more weird parts of that book. I also have a full mental breakdown that you can look forward to. I will be laying on the couch for that portion. Enjoy. It's a one star. I definitely should have DNF'd that book in hindsight, but it exists. Next up, in that same vlog, I have Her Master's Teacher by Lily White. New to me author, not on KU. This is Age Gap, Captor Captive. So as a reminder, I read a lot of dark romance. Please, please, please check trigger warnings before reading anything that I have read. A quick premise of this book is that Claire is a psychology professor at a college. She has Holland Strong for a student. She's already kind of caught his eye, but he really becomes interested in her when she does a lesson on Stockholm Syndrome. He really views this as her throwing down the gauntlet because she's like, there's some protective factors. There's ways you can combat it. And he's like, all right, challenge accepted. He is a master in training or a master. I hate using that term, but it's the language they use for the secret society where he trains courtesans. He ends up kidnapping her and things evolve from there. What I'll say about this. Um, I think the setup of this book was a little clunky for me. There was ways that Claire was acting as a professor where I was like, ma'am, that is not appropriate. She at one point talks to a student about her, like the professor, like her sex life. I was like, that's not appropriate. That doesn't seem very realistic. There's a little bit of it where I was initially reading it. I'm like, ooh, my buy-in on this is not high. However, once we got into the actual story, then I was in. I don't know, this ranks up there for Captor Captives for me because Claire is a psychology professor, as things are happening to her, she is analyzing it through that lens, like how she was being manipulated through their actions and through their words. I really liked that element of it because I do like that exploration of Stockholm Syndrome. Epilogue had a twist that I was like, um, brain melted. At every turn throughout the book, you're getting Claire and then, and then Holland's perspective. And in Claire's perspective, it's so different <laughs> than what's going on in Holland's was just wild because I'm like, I don't know what to believe. Do I even really understand what's going on here right up until the end right up until the end epilogue had additional information where I was like what wait a second I loved that part the way that like epilogue was delivered I was kind of like I feel like we could have woven this in a little bit but I am going to give this five stars. Understand that this is not a perfect book, but I like how it scrambled my brain. I like how it handled Stockholm Syndrome. Good enough for me, five stars. <laughs> Next up, I have The Lords of Eternal Night by Ben Alderson. This is a new to me author. This is on KU and it's an MM Beauty and the Beast retelling with like vampires and witches. The basic premise of this is witches have gone without magic and without powers for some time due to a curse. Dot comes along, he's born and they're like, wow, he has these like prophetic powers and he is going to be the end of this curse for us. What they end up doing is sending him in as a human sacrifice to this creature. They're like, hey, you should seduce him. And then on the last day when his power wanes, just like the creature Marius, who is a vampire, but they don't really call it that. He starts having some feelings and realizing perhaps he's been misled about a few things and begins to kind of like question the story he's been told. It went down really smooth for me. So I was really shocked when I looked on Goodreads and I was like, oh, the ratings on this are not that great. Two common critiques that I saw, one was world building was kind of like missing. Because we're primarily in the manor, I didn't mind that there wasn't a ton of world building because I didn't need a lot of information about the outside world. So that actually didn't bother me personally. I also saw some people mention, and this was something that I noticed, there are certain parts of it that are done in a very passive voice and that didn't bug me either. I don't know why it made 
made it feel more fairy tale-ish to me. My biggest complaint, honestly, was that the ending was a little bit rushed. With all that in mind, I gave it four stars. I really enjoyed it, and I definitely want to read more from Ben Alderson. Since we're talking about gay vampire stuff, next I have How to Bite Your Neighbor and Win a Wager by B.N. Brin, another new-to-me author. This is the first in a series called, like, The Guide to Dating Vampires or something like that. And this is a queer MM paranormal romance. This is more like urban fantasy and it's friends to lovers. The premise of this is that Vincent is a vampire. He's kind of been suffering in the shadows though. He doesn't have enough money to afford black market blood, which is the only way he can really feed because vampires aren't welcome members of the community. So what he's been doing is he's been breaking into people's homes after they've gone to sleep and is feeding off of them. So he ends up feeding off of Wesley and he's like, ooh, this blood particularly yummy. For Wesley, he's waking up with these vampire bites. He's like, oh my gosh, what's going on? But convenient for him, he needs to trap a vampire in order to pull off this scheme that he's got going on. He believes that Vitalis Baron, the pharmaceutical company, is responsible for his mother's death and he wants to break in and prove that, and he's going to use this vampire in order to do that. They need vampires for their studies. So he's like, this is a perfect opportunity. I'm gonna befriend him. Just as a side note, they spelled Baron wrong. It was with two R's, so. I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed. That aside, I really enjoyed this book. The vampirism was clearly being used as a mechanism to comment on marginalized groups, mental health, and also talk about issues of consent. So it was really used as a, as a vehicle to have other discussions. This is also closed door, which I actually really liked how this closed door style, because you were given enough like lead up that I was like, I'm satisfied. I don't really need the additional details. Sometimes I find like it a little bit fetishized. This was a very sweet romance. The chemistry could have been bumped up a notch. There were a few times where I'm like, this really just feels like friends. But other than that, I really liked it. I thought it was really sweet. Vincent just has like a, a special place in my heart. Four stars, really enjoyed it. I'll absolutely read more in that series. Next up, I have Next of Ken by Hannah Bottom Young. Once again, a new to me author. The first in a series called like Next or Up Next or something like that. Not on KU. I read uh, a lot of books not on KU this month. This is a new adult contemporary romance it, and it's like kind of single parent. The basic premise of this is that Chloe finds out her birth mother has given birth once again. Fresh out of college, she's the next of kin and her mother has said like, here, do you want this baby? So CPS does a background check on her once she agrees and CPS goes, hey, your financials don't check out. She's kind of working more like gig job or contract work, they propose to her, you can sign up for our new program, which essentially pairs you up with someone else who's also has like something that's not working out in their background check and kind of pairs you up so that you can both pass your evaluations. She ends up getting paired up with Warren. The reason that he's not passing his evaluation is because of a housing issue. He's not close enough to his brother's school who is deaf. Basically, they end up moving in together. But of course, we've got two people from very different backgrounds just being shoved together. So there's clashes on how this whole roommate situation is gonna work out. Thoughts on this book? Very basically, I did not like this book. It's single POV. Well, I don't know. My issues with that, I don't know if they would have been resolved by a dual POV, to be honest. All the characters are very flat, but Chloe came across particularly flat and a little bit of like toxic positivity. She would screw up and do things wrong, but she always had this like very therapist ready answer, always did the right thing or the thing you should do after that. She was always who understanding. And I was like, girl, just get mad. Set some decent boundaries. Stop being so understanding of everyone. It, and it just made her come across flat because she's not, she's not really feeling a lot of emotions very deeply. With Warren, I was really kind of distressed because he, oh good lord, the sun's coming out. Warren clearly has some anger management issues that were never noted anywhere else. He straight up punches a wall at one point and I was like, ooh, I don't like that. He also sings to her at one point. Full body cringe, hated that. And then the relationship, I just didn't really understand why they didn't want to get together. Also elements introduced into the relationship of like, okay, once we pass our evaluations, then we'll look at like maybe dating after that. But then that gets thrown out like so fast. So I was like, okay, I don't really understand what's happening here. And then the kids, they just didn't feel real. They only were used to serve the plot. The baby would cry only if it served to further the discussion or what was going on with Chloe. She never cried at inopportune times. There was never her saying no 
to things because she needed to stay with the baby. The baby was just like straight up not in scenes. I feel like I'm rambling about that, but hopefully you get my point. Like the kids were just used to serve the plot and not because they were like fully developed people. Next up, we have The Doctor by Nikki Sloan. This is the first book in the Nashville Neighbor series, but because I'm a feral raccoon, I read The Pool Boy, which is the second book, and I read The Frat Boy, which is the fourth book in the series already, and really enjoyed those. Tropes with this one, ex-boyfriend's dad, age gap, that sort of a thing. So the basic premise is that Greg Lowe doesn't have a great relationship with his son, Preston, because he wasn't involved in his early life. Cassidy breaks up with Preston after dating for many years, because she's just feeling like he's phoned it in. He's being kind of neglectful. Uh, Dr. Greg is there to comfort our girl. I really liked this. Even though the spice started very early on, I liked how the attraction was built here. It's very clear that they're attracted to one another, but are very confused and very ashamed of it. They'll have that little like intrusive thought and then be like, oh, oh, no, we shouldn't be doing that. Or would just kind of be confused about like, what was that sensation? What was that feeling that I just had? That was weird. So I like liked how that was done because it felt pretty genuine and it wasn't just like, oh my God, my ex's dad is so hot. The other thing that I liked too, the attraction was pretty, I felt like it was pretty well explained, at least from Cassidy's side. From Dr. Greg's side, I'm like, sir, <laughs> jail. If you were a real person, jail. But he was just like a nicer, more mature, version of his son, essentially. So I liked that it kind of made sense why Cassidy would cling to him, especially after the reasons she broke up with Preston. And the other thing too, Nikki Sloan just kind of did her classic thing where she really does a great job of using Spice to develop the relationship. Um, and she really takes her time and she's not rushing to get through any of the scenes. She's really giving you every little feeling and like micro emotion that they're having where it feels like you're really in real time experiencing this with the characters. There's no big rush to like get to the final portion of things. That said, I do wish there was like one or two less steamy scenes and just like one or two more of them actually talking or just like get into a little bit more plot because I just felt like I did get a little bit bored towards the end because I was like, all right, well, we've done this before. For all those reasons, I gave it four stars. I really did like this, but I will say this has been my least favorite, but it's still a really solid read. Next up, I have a book that I actually am in the process of reading right at this very moment. It's Sicko by Amo Jones. This is on KU, at least currently. No, know Amo was actually talking about pulling a lot of her stuff off of KU, so I don't know if that's still true. And it is a dark foster brother, motorcycle club romance, sort of new adult. I don't know. There's a lot of things going on in this book. <laughs> Basic premise of this because I, I'll be honest, I don't think that this, this abstract, this synopsis really <laughs> explains what's going on in the book, but this is what it's peddled as. Jade is taken in by Royce's family when she's very, very young. She's a baby. He is extremely protective of her, but at some point he's first out, he joins an MC, and then when they get back in touch, they are fighting because Jade is like, you weren't there to protect me, and he is now called Sicko because he's part of this MC and he is gruffer and tougher than he's ever been. I will say I'm only 50% into this book, but I do want to include it as part of this wrap up. I'll probably finish it in the next like day or two when I'm editing this. At the moment, this is what I'm thinking. I don't mean this to sound like an insult to Amo. Probably gonna come across that way anyway. I'm just sorry. I don't know how else to say this. The way this is written comes across a little bit high schoolers wish fulfillment. That sounds so mean and I hate that, but hopefully you kind of understand what I'm saying. It's just a lot of name dropping of brands of like clothing, cars, and like specific models of cars. I'm finding that that kind of like chucks me out. I actually really don't like that kind of thing. This just lacks context from scene to scene. You're only getting a certain amount of information per scene and the chapters or the scenes are pretty long, but like in between them, there isn't a lot of connective tissue. So I think I'm just finally picking up on what the plot is. So the best way I can kind of like explain this is like, uh, so like at one point a character is introduced and there's just no context, but they are the villain. Is he the neighbor? Is he a business associate? There's just not enough information for me to really understand like who this person is, but I know that they're the villain. It's like, there's like a lack of world building almost. But it also happens in like little things where it's like, and he's going to play on the LA team. What LA team? Like basketball? Football? Like what are we talking about? There's just kind of like missing context. That, that's, the, that's all my critiques. 
of, of this. What I will say is that it's just kind of like a fun wild time. It's like if Tate James and Penelope Douglas got together is the only way I can think to describe Amo Jones writing. If you don't know either of those authors, I'm so sorry. How I'm feeling about it right now is it's probably gonna be like a four star, but if I have additional things I wanna say, I will pop in now. So I'm gonna pop this down to a 3.5 actually. I feel like the further I got in, the less I understood about this book. And there was just a little bit too much going on and even more context that was lacking so that's where I'm landing with that one. Next up I have The Hitman by Katrina Jackson. This is the second book in a series that's not on KU. She's a new to me author and this is a mafia romance. The basic premise is that Zara was engaged to this like action movie star who ends up cheating on her with her maid of honor and then also a stripper and so she ends up stealing his credit card and going on their honeymoon just by herself where she ends up meeting Julio who is her neighbor next door who is very annoyed with the fact that she keeps crying. I'm gonna keep my thoughts on this brief. I have a whole mafia reading vlog I'll put up in the cards. Basically, I just didn't really care about either of these characters. They're both extremely, extremely horny and love to talk about the physical response that their body is having to the other person's physical appearance. Their connection really isn't much deeper than that. There was just a lot of sexualizing things that I just didn't need to be sexualized, like car rides and toes. And just to be honest, like plot wise, just not a ton happens. Just overall, I was kind of like, I felt very meh about the characters. I felt meh about the the plot or the lack thereof. You might like this, but it's just not for me. Next up, we have Control Me, and that is by Michelle Hurd. So this was a, another new to me author, second book in a series. Once again, I'm a feral raccoon. You can't tell me what to do. You are not my real daddy. I didn't like how I said that. Gross. It's a second book in a series. It's also a mafia romance, uh, sort of a bully romance. It's on KU. The basic premise of this is that Abby is a painter, but she's also a mafia princess. Her dad has some hits out on her. What? No. <laughs> dad has some hits out on him. So he's like, you need to know how to protect yourself, sends her to the school. I don't remember the name of it because I don't care. There she runs into Nikolai. She doesn't realize he's a teacher there and hits on him and then like doubles down on the hitting on him and then that makes him mad. So he's like, you should take this seriously. So he gets really mean to her. This book frustrated the crap out of me. Characters were very shallow and inconsistent. We were kind of told how to think about the characters in one way and then they would act in another. I have a whole rant about this towards the end of the vlog. So if you'd like to just see that, it's there. And there was just a lot of inconsistencies with the characters themselves where like, uh, you know, he's like, this is a one night stand. And then he'd be like, oh, Mishka. I, I think I made it about like a third of the way through. The book didn't have a lot going on, but yet we kept having these big jumps between chapters. Also didn't get a lot of context as to what was going on in the school. There's all these different people, all these different classes, atmosphere and grounds that we could have. And we just got nothing. There wasn't like a lot like pushing it forward. Also, I was really frustrated with the fact that there was zero forbiddenness to this. They are from rival groups. In fact, Nikolai is from a mafia that has a hit out on her father. And no one bats an eyelash when they are talking about getting together. He's also like twice her age. I, there was just so much about that, that or I was like, ooh, we could really like go somewhere with this. Everyone was like, age is just a number. I'm like, you know, I mean, it is, but also she's from a rival mafia group. Like, I think we have some other qualms that we need to focus on that we're just kind of glossing over. I dig enough that, no stars. I hated it. Next up, we have Rebel King by Gina L. Maxwell. This is the second book in a series called The Deviant Kings. It is on KU. It's like a slash paranormal romance, sort of urban. It's taking place in Las Vegas, but it's sort of got like a royalty mafia type vibe. I don't know. The romance is technically forbidden and then there's a big mystery. The basic plot of this is that Tiernan is the spare to the, the Fey throne. And he's basically forced under the throne because of the events of the previous book. He went from being like carefree playboy to having to be buttoned up. And part of that means giving up his like, his fuck buddy, Fiona, who is like of a lower caste. There are some things that happen in which they need to investigate some people that are killing Faye. My thoughts on this, the book felt very confused. It did not know what it wanted to be. Half of it's high fantasy, half of it's urban fantasy. There's like royalty elements thrown in because of that. It's paranormal. There's a mystery going on. And then randomly there's like a BDSM king club. It, it just felt like there was too much going on and not enough time spent on any one thing. Felt like this should 
should have just been like a mafia romance. And then it would have made so much more sense. And then Tiernan, <laughs> Tiernan has this like weird, sad backstory. <laughs> I'm sorry, it made me laugh because Fiona was like, he won't open up to me and like be kinky with me. I'm so sad. And then he reveals why. And he's like, <laughs> it really tears me up. I was like, sir, are you kidding me? That's your sad backstory? No, no, it's not. That's so dumb. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being really vague, but I don't want to spoil it. Two stars. <laughs> this was a big fat eye roll. I didn't care about this book. I just like, I was kind of laughing when I was reading it. So I was like, oh, this is, this is not a good book. <laughs> Next up, I have Broken Whispers by Neva Altash. This is also in the Mafia Romance reading vlog. This is the second book in the series. It's on KU, Mafia Romance, uh, Arranged Marriage, and Single Parent. Basic premise is that the Russian Brapa is having to kind of like make amends and make up with Italian Mafia. Mafia. So they are marrying off one of the Capo's daughters and one of the like head honchos from the Barafa. So Mikolai is the lucky winner in this scenario. He has been admiring Bianca from afar because she is a ballerina. When it turns out that uh, she's being offered up as tribute, he's like, I, I will, I will marry her. Yes, it will be me. And they're both dealing with different disabilities. Bianca has lost her voice. She can't talk or has difficulties with it. Mikolai has has no sight in one eye. I loved this book for like the first 60% of, of it. I was having a really good time. I love arranged marriage. Can we make this work? What do we want this relationship to look like? Are we just business partners? Can it be more? So it was a lot of sweet domestic moments. After like the 50 or 60% mark, I just didn't really feel like the relationship was progressing in any regard. It was kind of the same scenes over and over again. It was like them going to pound town and like interacting with other people who were either like, like, you're in love, you're not in love, that was kind of it. And then I got really annoyed at the end because the end scene was supposed to be like this penultimate moment and it was just, it was so corny. It, it was just so ridiculous too. I don't know, I provide more details in the Mafia Romance reading vlog. I don't wanna rehash it. It was very frustrating for me. I give it three stars and I'm really sad about it. I really, I was really hoping for more like Mafia elements. Oh, I left two good ones for last. All right, next up I have Before I Let Go by Kennedy Ryan. This is the first in a new series that she's doing. It's not on KU. It's Second Chance, Marriage in Trouble, mental health issues, all the things. Yasmin and Josiah have just kind of had one too many things thrown at them in life and they end up getting a divorce, but they're still amicably raising their children and also running a restaurant together. But their feelings are stirred up when Josiah starts dating the head chef. It starts reopening old wounds and old feelings. Or usual, it was very emotional. I listened to it on audio and the narrators on this did such a spectacular job. I was like trying to put on makeup for my work conference and like tearing up, which says something because like I don't I, I don't really get like misty eyed very often with books. And the thing that I really loved about all these characters is they felt like whole people. They were, there was no one that was villainous for the sake of being a villain. The children had their own path and their own thoughts and feelings and how they were processing and whose side that they were taking and why and when. And you could see how both of them were hurting each other. Their grief, uh, there was like a line where they said like, our grief is just incompatible. And that's really what this was, is that they were grieving in different ways and were so frustrated because they couldn't grieve with their partner. It caused the disintegration of their relationships. You could understand both sides and no one was like a, a villain. No one was perfectly right. Spectacular spectacular. I loved them trying to process emotions very logically, but emotions aren't logical. And so, you know, they're like struggling because it's not working. Once again, Kennedy Ryan hurt me deeply and personally, but it was so good. This is a five star. It crushed my tiny heart, but I loved every second of it. <laughs> I'm fine. Last up, I have Sing Me a Song by C.A. Renee. So this is not in KU. However, it is free on pretty much any provider platform, like the big ones anyway. So it's free on Amazon, Apple Books, and Barnes and Noble, and a few other places. It's the first in the series called The Sacrificial Lambs, and it's a novella. This was a new to me author. It's age gap, it's dark romance. It's sort of sort of a rock star romance. Got like a cult-like vibe, like think Illuminati. The basic premise of this is that Raiden is the front man for a band. He's having his birthday. Rumors swirl around him. They're, they're a very creepy group. 
they're like, they're, they're Satan worshipers, something's wrong with them. They end up hiring Temptus along with a few other strippers to entertain them on this private island. Temptus is like, excellent. I can't wait to make some like cold hard cash in a very short amount of time. And then very quickly realizes like, oh shoot, I definitely think I got in over my head with this one. This is very dark, very violent. It definitely alludes to some like PSA stuff. None of that happens on page, but it is sort of like the lead up is talked about. Very, very, very dark to the point that I would not describe this initial novella as a romance necessarily. Like it's very toxic and it feels more like, like obsession, like toxic obsession, I think would be the best way to describe it. Because they're not very loving. They're not having any like nice moments together. It's very eerie. The thing that I loved about this, although it's a novella, it spent a good chunk of time actually setting this up, which I felt like we needed so that when all the really dark stuff comes in like the last 60%, you feel like you know who you're interacting with and, and you understand kind of this really sad backstory that Tempest comes from, why she's making the decisions that she is. You know, she doesn't have a lot of money. A lot of this is based on survival for her. So honestly, this was a lot of commentary I felt like on like power dynamics with money. And it just like, it had this very gritty feel to it. It was like a couple of twists. The cliffhanger was a twist that I was like, mind blown. I need to read the next novella. I already purchased it. I already added a bunch of other stuff from C.A. Renee to my TBR. So I was like, this, this is what I like. Got cult vibes. It's gritty. It's, oh, I just, I don't know what else to say. Five stars. Is it a perfect book? No. Is there a lot of romance? No. Did I still love it? Absolutely. With that, thank you so much for being here. Comment down below. Let me know what your favorite book from September was. Let me know if you've read any of these books. Do you have the same opinion? Do you have a different opinion? Yeah. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it. Subscribe if you want more content from me. And I hope I see you on my next video. Bye-bye.